Hello again. Welcome to another edition of the Petty Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Petty. Today's uh, presentation is going to be an overview on arguments about why masks cannot and do not work. Um, I've had many requests for information like that, and so this podcast is going to be uh, designed to load you up with information that you might use to make arguments against masks. I've also had uh, many, many responses saying we need less of you and more of the uh, information, and so we've done that. And uh, so there'll be less of me and more of this. All righty. Um, as far as the uh, presentation goes, let's get started. The three levels I'm going to look at are um, looking at uh, why masks can't work from 100,000 feet or at the state, county, and worldwide level. Then I'm going to look at the epidemiological studies, and then I'll look at it from a micro standpoint. At all three levels, one can prove that masks do not and cannot work. The 100,000-foot level argument. One can take data on cases or deaths for any location in the world through world meters and plot them like I have here. Here I picked New York State. You can see across the bottom that you can pick any state or any country for that matter. And if you really believe that masks were the, uh, would work, you wouldn't expect to see this sort of patterning of cases with time. You would expect that masks would lower the cases with time. Of course, that's not happening. Um, the real When I ask people why you see these sorts of patterns, uh, I think primarily you see them because people are more likely than not to get COVID when they're indoors where contaminants can be concentrated. So in the northern climates where it's cold, you see the cases spike in the Winter months and in the summer, you see them spike in the southern in the um, summer months. You can also see from this high level; uh, these are um, plots um, with time of uh, COVID cases normalized uh, in LA, Orange, Ventura, and San Diego counties with time. And you can see in the red boxes where mandates have gone on, and lo and behold. Don't those cases drop? Not. Obviously, there's something else going on here, and masks don't have much to do with anything. You can also look at this uh, worldwide at the macro level, and you can see these are two plots. Uh, Israel, where masks were required um, over time, and Sweden, where they were not. And interestingly enough, um, the masks don't seem to have had much to do with lowering case rates at all. Let's look at the epidemiological or the ground level arguments. Perhaps the best study out there, in my opinion, is the Bundegaard et al. study in Denmark, where they looked at around six, they started with 6,000 participants, split them in half, double blind, 3,000 or so with masks and 3,000 or so without masks, and they looked to see was there any difference in the rate at which people got COVID with time? And within the statistics, they found basically that wearing masks did not affect the rates of COVID infection. Now, this study took a long time to get published because obviously it provided the wrong answer. That is that masks don't work. And uh, CDC is uh, dumped on this study and they claim, well, one of the reasons they claim is it only used 0.1% of the country's population. Well, while we all like to have epidemiological studies, more is better, there is no requirement that uh, an epidemiological study be based on the country's population. That's just a, a bogus argument, in my opinion. Um, there's a, this is a bit busy, but there's another study uh, on um, masks in schools by Oster. He looked at, uh, they looked at data from Florida, New York, and Massachusetts. And what they found with respect to data in Florida, and I'll show it to you in a second, is that we do not find any correlations with mask mandate, i.e. the infection rate and mask wearing. There's no correlation versus not wearing. 
Uh, I should I should note on the bottom here that when you review the CDC studies, what you will find over and over again is they suffer from two flaws. One, they don't have a baseline. In other words, they don't have a control group. That is a group that's similar to the group wearing masks, not wearing masks. So you can see if there's a difference. Or they have confounding situations where they have people wearing masks, doing social distancing, doing uh, HVAC improvements. So they have a whole host of things going on. And they claim, well, this made a difference, but it's not possible to break out the mass because you got all those other factors going on. So what did the Florida study show? This is a bit busy, but basically had uh, groups in different bins, if you will. They had students and staff that were masked. They had staff only that were masked. And then they had no students or staff masks. And they plotted basically infection rate versus time. And, and what they found basically is within the statistics, it really didn't make a difference, um, as I pointed out in the first summary uh, sentence from the paper. Um, when you looked at um, accounting for the data for different community disease rates and demographics and then looked at the error bands around that data, this really shows that, that basically whether you wore a mask or didn't wear a mask, it didn't make any difference. Uh, with respect to disease infection rates. Um, so, so again, what did Oster and, the, and those folks say? We did not find any correlation with the mask mandate. In other words, whether a mask was worn or not, it did not affect the infection rate of students or teachers in the schools in Florida. It's one of the few where you actually have impacts of mask wearing versus not wear, mask wearing in a single study. There's another uh, study that's got a lot of attention. It's a large study across Georgia uh, by Gettings et al. And um, they, they made claims that one should wear masks in schools, and yet the data from the schools that they monitored doesn't say that. In other words, you've got a paper that's been used to say masks work, but the paper doesn't really say that. And in fact, here's one of the sentences that, that you can pull from it. It says the 21% lower incident rate in schools that required mask use was not statistically significant compared to schools where the mask was optional. Well, what's that mean? It, it, may, it means that, yeah, they saw a lower disease rate with mask wearing, but it wasn't sufficient to be justified in terms of making a final conclusion. What do I mean by that? Uh, this is a little busy, but this is the actual data from the paper. And what they've done here is they've got two cohorts, if you will, mask requirements uh, for teachers and staff members in these schools, whether it be optional, in other words, that don't have to wear it, or required. And the other is where the same situation, but for students. And what I've circled off to the right is, um, while you may see a, a slight difference in relative risk reduction, the key point to look in these studies from an epidemiological standpoint is the 95% confidence interval. And if the value on the left side of the confidence interval is not one or greater, then it means that there's not statistical significance, meaning that you can't draw a conclusion one way or the other. And so um, while they do show a relative risk reduction, the, the left value, the 95% confidence value, is less than one, meaning the results are not significant. So in fact, this study doesn't show that mass made a difference. At the micro level, and you've heard these from previous podcasts, uh, I show this uh, chart whenever I go out and make public presentations. And this uh, is a visual showing the cross-section of a human hair um, in the white circle and a one micron particle in the red dot. And recall that the COVID particles are on the order of a tenth of a micron or so. So the COVID particles are about a thousand times or so smaller in diameter than a cross-section of a human hair. And I ask people over and over again, could you get a human hair past the side of your mask, especially on either side of your nose, below your eyes? And of course the answer is yes. So we don't even have to worry about the effectiveness of the mask, even though it's low, um, because we, we have huge gaps. And by definition, masks cannot seal. If they could seal, they'd be called respirators. Uh, the other uh, point to be made, and I've talked about this in other podcast, and this is a little bit busy again, but uh, a gentleman by the name of Drunik um, looked at what happens when you put holes in masks. And what he found was the efficacy of whatever the efficiency of the mask was is reduced by 75% if you get uh, a hole equivalent or a gap equivalent to 2% of the mask area. 
when you project those lines out, what you find is that the um, around three percent or so, uh, if there's if the mask gap area is around three percent, it doesn't matter what the effectiveness of the mask is, the overall effectiveness is zero. So the gaps are very critical, and that's what I've done here is project that out. Um, there's some really good work done by Shaw and, and his cohorts on actually what the effectiveness of masks and, and N95s were. And uh, this was assuming one micron particle, so relatively large particles, um, but also using a sealed mass with no gas, no gaps. And what did he find? He found that the high efficiency mass, the N95s, if you will, were 60 and 46 percent effective with perfect seals, no gaps. But cloth masks were only 10% effective and surgical masks only 12% effective. As I indicated, they weren't conservative results because they assumed sealed masks, and that's not the real world. In other words, this is a picture of how uh, experimental setups uh, do testing on masks. And I ask everybody, is that how the mask is sealed to your face? Uh, I don't think so. Um, and Drunik commented on this as follows, and I think it's, it's an important point I've been making over and over. Surgical mask as well as cloth mask never, repeat, never have a perfect fit on the face, even though the experimental work that you see in many of these studies assumes that. And the leaks past the mask material in the skin allow masks to pass through it without being filtered. And this is the main reason that masks are not effective. Um, and they, he, he went on to say, and I, this is what I've been pushing for many, many months, almost two years now, that the engineering controls of dilution and destruction are the way that you really control the um, exposure, if you will. And um, it's really clear, too, he's using the word aerosols, meaning that um, you hear CDC say all the time, well, masks can stop droplets, but the droplets aren't the issue, it's the aerosols. Um, the other thing that's interesting is this uh, American Industrial Hygiene Association. That's a trade organization that I belong to and many industrial hygienists do. And they put out on September 9th some guidance on COVID. And they have a very interesting plot that I want to spend a minute or two with you on. Um, and that's this one here. It's sort of this inver inverted pyramid, but let's, let's look off to the right. Um, what they have is what they call relative risk reduction. And that means how do we restrict the risk? For instance, if the relative risk reduction is to, re, re, um, is to have a risk reduction such that you don't get COVID. Well, um, and you have some technology to do that. What they're saying here, and, and this is a key point, is that for a technology to be viewed by industrial hygienists as being acceptable, it must have a relative risk reduction of 90% or more. And that makes sense. We want to protect a large majority of the people with whatever we promote, because I don't think it would be acceptable, for instance, if I put a solution out there that saved 10% of the people from getting asbestosis and, and let the other 90% get it. So we have in industrial hygiene this, this concept that we want to protect a supermajority of the people. So what do they show in this chart? It's fascinating. They show that engineering controls uh, up to four and a half air changes per hour will do that. Now, what's that mean? That means if you took fresh air and, in a, and replaced the air in a given room four and a half times each hour, that that would dilute, if you will, whatever contaminant concentration was emitted in terms of COVID to a level where 90% of the risk reduction, whether it be a 90% risk reduction. But what's also fascinating is Look down below where face coverings um, for all occupants and COVID only. They're saying, well, that only protects 5 to 10% of the people. And this, when you get into the bowels of this, this makes very conservative assumptions about how well the masks seal. Well, even if you say, if you agree with this and you say 5 to 10% of the um, people would have the risk reduced, then that means 90 to 95% of the people would not. Well, that wouldn't be an acceptable solution. So that's why masks can't be an acceptable solution. The N95, this was done a while back. They said, well, that's also a 90% risk reduction. But remember the Shaw work that I just showed that said it was more like 50 to 60. So that doesn't meet the 90% threshold. And that's why I've been saying that certainly N95s are better than masks because they're a respirator. They seal. 
but they still don't get the risk reduction that we would desire based on the latest work from Shaw. This summarizes that real quick. Masks only have a relative risk reduction of 5 to 10 percent that do not meet that 90 percent threshold that we need as industrial hygienists to ensure the health and safety of people and the public. And that uh, air changes per hour on the order of 4.5 to 6 are, uh, would do that. The N95s, they say it will, but the latest work from Shaw says probably not. Um, they, uh, they make a very generous estimate of the 5 percent to 10% relative risk reduction for face masks and cl uh, cloth face coverings, but as I've shown you earlier, if you have a 2 to 3% uh, gap around those, it drops almost to zero. As always, if you have any questions, comments, criticisms of the podcast, please let me know. I hope this has been helpful. Have a great day.